So what's the weather like in Baton Rouge?
everyone welcome to this month's astronomy on tap we're coming to you live from baton rouge and we're so happy to see you all here on youtube it's our third anniversary this month so thank you very much for giving us three lovely years of shows we know we had a short break in there but oh well um we're still using this opportunity of being online to bring you exciting out of town speakers including our two speakers today so before we get started with those talks here are the usual ground rules. One, be considerate in the chat. We haven't had any issues with this, but it's always worth saying. Number two, feel free to drop any questions you have for our speakers at any point during the talk within the chat. I will field them to the speaker after the talk is over. Number three, please consider donating to our Venmo and PayPal. And as always, we like to add some competition into our donations. So this month we're asking you, if you prefer the real Perseverance Twitter run by NASA or the fake Perseverance Twitter account, they're both pretty good and they both have lots of really funny tweets. And we have a collection of them on our um, in-break slides that you can look through. Um, you may have noticed that Perseverance actually landed on Mars this past month. So that's sort of why we came up with this one. So definitely uh, go on to YouTube and find that NASA video of the actual Mars landing because it is really cool. And if you're interested in it, it's just probably one of the coolest things I've seen this year. If you do make a donation to our PayPal or Venmo, 
please make sure to write your um, whatever you're voting for in the memo section of that donation. Lastly, please like this video if you're watching and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We do now have um, enough people to have a unique YouTube link, so we do have that as well. I think someone can probably put it in the chat um, if they are feeling so inclined. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for subscribing and coming and um, uh, supporting us through all of this. And without further ado, we'll move right on to today's talks. So our first speaker is a professor emeritus at UT Austin. His primary research interest is in exploding stars and especially on supernovae. He said when he was in high school in Idaho, he got to spend every October picking potatoes and that seems like our kind of dream high school experience. So please give a very warm welcome to our first speaker, Dr. Craig Wheeler, if he wants to start sharing his screen and we can get that started. Hi, Courtney. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I got the range, do I? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Share screen. And... Huh. I ended up at the end there. I need to get back to the beginning. That's what I get for practicing beforehand. Oh, no. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, so I want to talk tonight about the star Betelgeuse, which I've had an obsession about for quite some time and have done some research on uh, recently. And so I want to uh, tell you that story of how I got interested in why and what we've learned about it. Uh, I hope everybody recognizes Betelgeuse, or many people, uh, is in the constellation Orion. You get the shoulders up here, the, the belt, the sword, and the bottom of the kilt. The, the Betelgeuse is our interest here, the bright red-orange star up there in the, in the corner. Uh, it, it affects the region around it. I'll come back to the importance for that. Uh, th this picture is particularly important because it illustrates the fact that mo most stars are just points of light in the sky, regardless of what telescope you're looking at, the Hubble Space Telescope or telescopes on the ground. Uh, Betelgeuse is big enough in size and it is close enough in space that with some special techniques, we can actually see the size of the star. That's a rare thing, but it makes uh, special studies of Betelgeuse possible, and I'll get back to that. So let me uh, give you an outline of talk. I want to give some background of uh, how Betelgeuse caught my interest, all uh, besides just walking out and looking at Orion, a bit, bit more than that. Uh, some issues that came up in terms of how fast it rotates, possible solutions in terms of two stars merging together. Uh, a little bit about the technology of astero seismology, which is like doing seismology on the Earth where you get earthquakes underground, but they send waves out and you can measure them on the surface. Uh, there's an analogy that uh, you can do with stars, that, that the star can vibrate on the inside, but send patterns of light to the outside. And some of those implications. Uh, then I want to talk about the great dimming of a year ago where Betelgeuse got especially dim and it's now recovered and uh, what the implications of that might be. So here's a, a representation of, of Betelgeuse. It is what uh, astronomers call a red supergiant. Uh, stars, when they first start burning hydrogen into helium in the main part of their lifetime, tend to be blue-white, although smaller stars like the sun can be yellowish. But then as they age, they expand. And when they expand, they cool. And a typical color of a star when it expands is reddish. And so that's where the red comes from. Uh, the supergiant comes uh, not because they're very large in space, although Betelgeuse absolutely is, uh, because they, but because they're supergiant in luminosity. They're especially bright, and, and Betelgeuse is, the fact that we can see it so clearly in the night sky. So th this graph uh, and, and map here represents that a little bit. Here's something representing the size of Betelgeuse, and it's a messy, swirly thing. We'll come... We'll come back to that, but it's got a certain size and we can actually see that from, from the Earth. So here's a representative picture of the sun, which is a tiny thing on this scale, and, and the inner planets. So you can probably hardly make out those <coughs> dots there. 
but they're also uh, positioned out in distance from the sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And Betelgeuse is bigger than all of that. If you put Betelgeuse in the middle of our solar system, it would be so big, it would eat up all those inner planets. It, it is almost big enough to reach out to the orbit of Jupiter. So it's a very large star physically. Again, the supergiant word is because it's super bright, not because it's super big, but it is super big. Uh, it also uh, blows off matter into space. It's a complicated environment. It sheds matter into space, which is this artist's representation is, is showing. And, and it's, it's scaled here with the size of the star. And you go out to twice the size, up to five, six, seven, eight times the star. And there's still Betelgeuse stuff wafting out into space or what that represents. So it, it's a complicated environment. We'll, we'll be mostly concentrating on the, on the star itself here tonight. Uh, one of the wonderful things about this project as I got into it is I worked with a bunch of really bright, energetic undergraduates. And uh, I, they've now scattered around to graduate school around the world. But uh, I'll come back and, and talk about the work of a couple of them in particular. But it was a, a real delight to have these uh, energetic young people involved in the project. So I, I developed this uh, obsession. And here's, here's how I got into it, that I, I would give popular talks on supernovae, my uh, professional undertaking, as, as Courtney said. And I wouldn't say anything about Betelgeuse, but in the question and answer period afterward, there would often be somebody that would say, well, what's going to happen when Betelgeuse blows up? And my standard response was, you know, the last time I gave a talk like this, somebody asked me that question, and I promised I would go off and think about it, but I haven't. And so here I am again, uh, wiggling my way out of this. So after several years of that, I finally did a little homework on what would happen when Betelgeuse uh, blows up. And uh, I, I was uh, writing a book from these classes I was teaching for, for non-science majors and, and wrote a little sidebar about what Betelgeuse would do when it blew up, uh, putting some numbers to it, a little more perspective on it. So in that uh, little bit of homework I did, but continuing my obsession, uh, what we expect is that a, a star of, of kind of any kind, the sun will do a mini version of this, Betelgeuse is doing a big version of it. The star starts off made primarily out of hydrogen. Uh, it burns that hydrogen in a thermonuclear sense and forms the element helium down on the inside. Uh, the helium can then burn in a thermonuclear sense and make carbon and oxygen and even heavier elements. So there's a sequence of heavier elements uh, developed inside the star. And, and finally, you make a core of iron. So the ordinary old element iron that you make steel out of. But it turns out that iron has a special thermonuclear process. Uh, th there is no way you can burn that iron and get more energy out. You get energy out when you burn hydrogen to helium or helium to carbon. But once you make iron, it turns out to act like a sponge of energy. Whether you make heavier elements out of it or break it apart into lighter elements, it sucks energy out of the star. And when that happens, it will take out energy, it takes out pressure, and that iron core will collapse down uh, to make a, uh, an inner core. Uh, in the case of Betelgeuse, probably a neutron star would be my, my best guess. But Betelgeuse is kind of right on the edge of where it might make a black hole. I, I don't think that's the most likely thing, but uh, a priori, you can't certainly rule that out. But we do expect Betelgeuse to undergo a, a violent explosion, leaving that tiny remnant core behind, something roughly the size of a city, either a neutron star or a black hole, and sending a blast wave out into space. That's what we expect uh, Betelgeuse uh, to do. So when you get that uh, collapse of the iron core down, you'll make something like, uh, I'm giving you a number, doesn't make a whole lot of of sense, but it's a terrific large amount of energy in so-called neutrinos, which are little particles with very tiny mass. They move at almost the speed of light. They scarcely interact with any kind of matter at all. They just come rushing out of the star. But there's going to be a lot of them, and, and uh, Betelgeuse is pretty nearby. So you, you'll see the neutrinos, they, they travel at near the speed of light, but Betelgeuse is big. It will take about an hour. That's a light hour out from the center of the star for the uh, neutrinos to get to the surface of the star. And then they've got to traverse the space between uh, Betelgeuse and us. It'd be about 600 years later, roughly. And we would, a human body, the, the, the size and volume of a body uh, would, would receive about a hundred trillion neutrinos. 
And if you add up all that energy put into the body, uh, my first estimate was that that might be interestingly large, but but somebody in a colloquium said, you know, I think you're doing the numbers wrong, and I redid them. And it turns out that's vastly less than the lethal dose of radiation. So we will get a burst of neutrinos from Betelgeuse, but it won't be of any day. It would be scientifically very interesting, uh, but it is of no danger at all. Then the, there's a shock wave that comes out, not at the speed of light, but roughly the speed of sound. And that reaches the surface of the star uh, about a day later. And at that point, there will be a blast of ultraviolet radiation. Uh, it's not all that strong. It would be at, at the Earth. It would be dimmer than the ultraviolet light from the sun. But you might uh, disturb the atmospheric chemistry a little bit. So uh, that's, that's possible. Then in a couple of weeks, uh, the star will get very, Betelgeuse, when it blows up, will get very, very bright, about a billion times brighter than the sun is uh, in intrinsically, uh, uh, about as bright as a quarter moon, people's estimates vary, but of that order, except there's still a point of light. It's not going to be as big as the moon. It's a point of light, but intensely bright. And that will last for about three months. So here's a pattern of what the light looks like when a star blows up as a supernova. Uh, there's two rough types that we call type one and type two in a great flight of imagination. Uh, some of them uh, rise to a maximum light in a couple of weeks, and then they steadily fade away. But stars like Betelgeuse, we're pretty sure, will maybe go through a peak, but then they, they go through this almost constant luminosity phase for about three months, about 100 days, and then they fade away. And, and we expect Betelgeuse to do that. So to be uh, about as bright as a quarter moon, but lasting about three months. So it'll be quite a spectacular thing. Not dangerous because it's far enough away from that, but, but quite a uh, spectacular event when it happens. So I would uh, teach this class on non-science majors, uh, non-major undergraduates who had to take a science course in order to graduate from the University of Texas. And uh, after a while of, of writing this in the book and having people ask that questions, I began to ask my students to keep an eye on Betelgeuse. And the way I made the argument at the time was we are, we know it's going to blow up, but we are so ignorant about when it is that I'd like you to go out and look at it tonight. And if you see it getting brighter, let me know, because that's going to be really interesting. Could explode tonight. Uh, so I, I sort of pull that joke with a little serious science behind it for a order 20 years. And I, I added that up at some point. I, I think I probably did that with 5,000 students. And I, I hope they're out there looking at Betelgeuse every night. Um, surely they're not, but maybe they'll remember. I told them, go out and, and, and take your grandchildren out and point at that star and tell them it's going to blow up. So that, that was the, the joke for, for quite a while. And this is a little cartoon I found just sort of illustrating that. So, aliens uh, escaping the explosion of Betelgeuse down here. So that was the origin of my, of my uh, obsession. But, but then it got kind of serious. And I, while I was sort of making this joke in my class and talking about how massive stars are going to blow up, uh, I realized uh, that it was irritating not to know when Betelgeuse was going to blow up. That, that when I first started thinking about this, it might have been tonight. We really had no idea of what the, the scale was. Uh, as I thought about more, I decided it wasn't really going to blow up tonight, and we'll come, we'll come back to that. Uh, but to, to, to have that vague notion and put some science behind it, that was something else again. So it, it, uh, it, it was clear as I started thinking about it that uh, we, we just hardly knew anything about what was going on with Betelgeuse, except it was big and bright. Uh, that we didn't know the mass, which is a very fundamental thing to set the course of the star and how it, how it behaves. Uh, there, there were guesses that it might be about 15 times the mass of the sun, but it could have been quite a bit more, quite a bit less. So the, the uncertainty of that uh, bugged me. And, and so I began to think, well, what can we do about this scientifically? Not just talking about it casually in, in my class, which I was very happy to do, but what can we say about it uh, in a more quantitative scientific way? Uh, one possibility is to effectively look inside the star. It's opaque. You can't see down there. But as I alluded to in, in the introduction, there's this technique of asteroseismology that if there's rattling, surging, 
periodic things going on down on the inside, some of that might get out to the outside where you can see it. So it's like reading earthquake waves on the surface, except for a star. So we, that, that was sort of the premise of what we were going to look like when I started working with these undergraduates that I showed you there. So that was the beginning of, of what I then formally started calling the Betelgeuse Project, that we've now written three papers on it. The last one uh, just came out. And another point I wanted to make about this, what I was going to say in words, but I left myself a, a note here to make it a specific. There, there's a, an ongoing conversation that happens around a major research university like the University of Texas or Louisiana State of why did the professors spend all their time wasted in the lab or looking through telescopes when they ought to be teaching our students and sending it out in class to be whatever they're going to be? And, and uh, those of us who, who want to do research think about this topic. And, and, and this whole thing I'm talking about tonight is an illustration that uh, I always took my scientific research and brought it into the classes I taught. That, that was one of my passions to do. But this was an example where my teaching fed back into the research. It was a, it's a two-way street that if I hadn't been sort of making this joke about it'll just might blow up tonight, I wouldn't have started thinking seriously about how stupid we were about it and we needed to do something about it. So there, there is in, in the environment there in Baton Rouge or here in Austin of, of coupling the, the research and trying to understand the, the basic things that are going on with nature and then passing it on to the teaching and sometimes the teaching uh, feeds back again. I, it always does. Sometimes it's as distinct as this particular project. So we had this crude notion uh, that, that's based on work that other people had, had been doing at the time, that in the late stages of the nuclear burning of a star like Betelgeuse, you go from hydrogen to helium to carbon to oxygen, you burn the oxygen, that, that turns into silicon, it turns out silicon then burns to make the iron, that that, that burning gets turbulent and noisy and and it surges around, and that might sound waves, just waves that would propagate out to the surface, and maybe we could see them. So that, that was kind of the premise we started thinking about when we started the, the Betelgeuse project with these uh, undergraduates. So there are a couple of aspects of that, sort of observational aspect and theoretical aspect. Uh, the theoretical aspect was to try to predict what those perturbations would be on the inside and predict how strong they would be, how detectable they might be on the outside. Uh, one of the observational ironies that uh, arose in this, if you start to think about it, is that Betelgeuse is too bright. If you point an ordinary telescope that astronomers use for their science, that Betelgeuse should burn it out. Uh, Betelgeuse is so bright. So you can't point at it with ordinary telescopes. And, and that was a, an interesting restriction. People got other ways around that, but just the, the first order Obviously, let's try to let's just point our telescope at it. Uh, that didn't work. So we, we went through a phase of trying to predict the frequencies and the amplitudes of these pulsations. Uh, as we were thinking about this, uh, along came a very powerful new stellar evolution code for calculating how stars behave as they evolve. Uh, it's an open source code. So anybody contribute to it. Anybody can use it. Uh, there have been some codes like this before that were entirely proprietary with the people who wrote them. And, and the group uh, wor working with uh, Paxton at, at Santa Barbara, um, who came out of the Adobe crew and made a lot of money and decided this is what he wanted to do as a hobby. It's a, it's a wonderful story. Um, opened up this, this science for anybody to do it. It's, it's been a, a, a cultural phenomenon to, to write that code and make it available. So here came the code. Here was my obsession. I had some vague ideas and I had this talented group of undergraduates come knocking at my door. And so we tried to put that together into this project. So we, we looked at a bunch of different aspects of this, particularly the seismologies. I'm skipping over uh, some of that. But then we, we stumbled into something that I hadn't anticipated coming down the pike at all. And that was if there was something... That, that we deeply didn't understand about the rotation of Betelgeuse because it's spinning on its axis. So it turns out if you start off with a star rotating when it's first burning hydrogen into helium, you can set that up and, and that's okay. But as the Betelgeuse expands to become this really large thing that it does, it's like a skater opening up their arms to slow down and, and Betelgeuse will, as it 
turns into this red supergiant, it gets bigger, it will rotate more slowly. So we use this Mesa Stellar Evolution Code to look at that. And it turns out that the answer was it would be wrong by a factor of 150. It wasn't subtle at all that Betelgeuse would come not to a halt, but a very low velocity. If you just started it spinning when it was burning hydrogen and then let it go, it would be spinning very slowly compared to what the observations were. So there was a, a dilemma there. Uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Mano Satsopoulos, is listening on the YouTube. Uh, he recently wrote a paper confirming that and adding to that whole story. And, and another uh, very nice paper I want to comment on later by Meredith Joyce, a young woman who's a postdoc in Australia, uh, who picked up another wrinkle on this and, and, and made some good science out of it. So this was a dilemma. Uh, how, how can it be that, that uh, Betelgeuse is rotating as rapidly as it is when the basic science would say it should be rotating very slowly? So a uh, possible explanation was that Betelgeuse might not always have been a single star. There, there's background work done in other contexts that, that the majority, of, I'm calling them O and B stars. I'm sorry, that's a little technical, but basically just means massive stars, more than 10 times the mass of the sun. That the majority of those are born in binary systems with two stars going in order. So the sun's all alone except for its planets, but, but lots of stars, particularly massive stars, have another star in orbit around them. And then furthermore, there were people that argued that something like 20% of the apparently massive stars actually had been binaries and the two stars merged together at some point in their evolution. So the question uh, we, we raised was whether Betelgeuse might once have been a binary star system with two stars and merged. And so if you take one star and dump it into the other, uh, they're spinning around each other, they're orbiting around as they merge they will end up making a rapidly rotating thing. That, that was the idea. So suppose Betelgeuse uh, enveloped and merged with a companion star as it expanded to become this red supergiant. Uh, could we estimate what was the mass of the companion needed in order to spin up uh, Betelgeuse, which is a pretty massive thing. So you've got to have some lever arm to, to do that. And it turned out the answer was about a solar mass would be adequate to do the job. So. Uh, that doesn't prove it's a solar mass, it doesn't prove that it was a merger, but it makes it plausible that, that Betelgeuse had a sort of a lowish mass companion uh, that, that might have sped it up. So in the process of doing that, uh, it, it uh, occurred to me that uh, it, this will be a messy process and, and you will blow some matter out into space. It's not all going to uh, uh, stay on the star. And uh, this paper that uh, Manas Satsopoulos and his crew there at LSU just recently did, uh, did a, a numerical simulation of that. And this is an illustration of that, that the two stars, here's, here's the one and here's another coming in, getting ripped apart. And they blow matter out into space. It's, a, it's kind of a natural thing to do. I had a qualitative idea that they made it a more quantitative thing. So you're going to eject some matter at, at roughly the escape speed from the surface of the star, that's the characteristic velocity. Uh, so there might be a shell of matter coasting out. Uh, it, it, Betelgeuse is far enough away that you can guess at that velocity, where would that shell be that was created when the two stars merged? And uh, at that distance, how big would it be on, on, on the sky? And, and so I, I estimated very roughly that it might be uh, at an angular radius of, of 17 minutes of arc out there at, at that time, very roughly, within a factor of a few. Uh, so I did all that in, in the context of just trying to think about it. Um, and, and then I went and read the literature to find out what astronomers had actually been doing all that time. But I felt a little foolish because the answer was, was sort of already there. So here's some wonderful work done by, by uh, de San in, in France. Uh, and th so this is well known. This is data taken with an infrared telescope, uh, long wavelength radiation. But it, it turned out, I didn't know it, but astronomers who paid attention to Betelgeuse knew this, that, that Betelgeuse had a very famous shell of material. So I predicted about seven arc or 17 arc minutes 
And this shell of material turns out to be at about seven arc minutes away. There's an inner shell of about four arc minutes, so you can pick and choose. There's a really odd linear structure out there at nine arc minutes. So th this structure does not prove that Betelgeuse had a merger. But the fact that you would say if it had a merger, there ought to be a shell out there at about this size is at least consistent with it. You don't rule out the hypothesis of that. So what next? Uh, if Betelgeuse did have a merger, it makes the whole problem more complicated because now you've got two stars and they spin up and they might mix each other. And, and so the question of what's the evolutionary state and how long is it coming to explosion is more complicated now. So we went ahead and wrote a paper uh, led by Serafina Nance uh, that we published in 2018 uh, about some of these astero seismology issues. Uh, we went back to the question of exactly how big does a companion have to be or can it be to end up spinning Betelgeuse up to what we see now? And that was a paper that uh, Jamie Sullivan uh, led. Both Serafina and, and, and Jamie now, by coincidence, are graduate students at Berkeley doing completely different things by now. <clears throat> so what we found particularly in this, this more recent uh, Sullivan et al. paper is that the final rotation may not depend a lot on details, but just on the global issues of Where's the orbit and how big is it and how fast are they spinning around? Because uh, you, you can't have the thing spinning so fast it'll break up at the end. You have to shed any extra mass and angular momentum to measure how it, how it rotates. So it's, it's got to be a stable star by the time the dust clears. And that says it really doesn't depend on the details very much uh, is our argument now. So I want to say just briefly uh, about what uh, Meredith Joyce did. Because uh, there is another piece of information that I had pondered but not done anything about it. And, uh, and Meredith came along and used that piece of information to, to, to great effect. It turns out that Betelgeuse pulses with a period of 416 days. It, it's this big star. It's got a lot of complicated behavior, but it breathes in and out once every 416 days. Well, that, that's an extra piece of information that depends on the mass of the star and how big the star is, sets that time scale. And so I'd known that and I'd thought about it. I just didn't do anything about it. And Meredith came along and did a really bang up job of utilizing that piece of information. So one of the things that she proved, and I, by this time I had figured out that the most likely thing was that Betelgeuse was still it had burned hydrogen to helium, but it hadn't proceeded beyond that. That was the most likely probability. But Meredith proved that, that the only way to fit all this together and, and utilize that 416 days is that Betelgeuse is in core helium burning, and it has 100,000 years before it's going to explode. So I was At that point, that kind of blew my joke in the classroom to go out and look at it tonight, uh, but that's where the science led. Uh, it turned out uh, she got a tighter constraint on the radius of the star compared to previous estimates. She got a tighter constraint on the mass of the star that uh, her best guess is it was born with a slightly higher mass than people had been guessing between about 18 and 21 times the mass of the sun. And that it currently has somewhere between 17 and 19 uh, solar masses, having lost some mass in the meantime. And then what will be a little bit of a technical thing, but it was really important because so much of the uncertainty about Betelgeuse, it turns out, was because we didn't understand the distance very well. It, uh, if it's further away, it has to be brighter to shine at us. Uh, it has to be bigger to be as big as it looks like on the sky. Uh, but the distance was uncertain. So all those, the luminosity and the size were uncertain. Uh, so by, by uh, using this extra piece of information about the, the, the period, she found a tighter constraint on the, on the distance. It used to be uncertain by like 20%. She reduced that to a 10% uncertainty, and she lowered the number from like 640 light years, which I've already cited, and it was wrong, to about 540 light years. So it turned out Betelgeuse is a little bit closer than we thought, but really lovely piece of science using just that one more piece of data. I, I wish I'd done it, but I did. Meredith did. So let me talk, uh, that's as much as I want to kind of say about Betelgeuse for time. But let me talk a little bit about the, the so-called great dimming, uh, that, that people have been watching Betelgeuse since, in this particular record, back in the 1930s. 
uh, particularly the uh, amateur uh, uh, astronomy variable star observers are, are assiduous about looking at all sorts of things, but Betelgeuse in particular, and keeping a record of it. So a lot of this is AABSO data that, that you can see Betelgeuse rattling along, getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer. That's the 461 day period, by the way. And uh, so it traced it here for, you know, uh, almost a century. And it's bopping along here. There's some different kind of data that comes in lately. And then all of a sudden, a year ago, December, it goes whoop and got considerably dimmer than it had ever been before. And even my wife could go outside and look at it. She hadn't looked at Betelgeuse ever as far as I knew. But she went out and looked at it and said, hey, that's dimmer than it used to be. <laughs> no, it was a, a really obvious thing that anybody could go out and see. And it caught the attention of a lot of people and certainly people whose interest was in uh, in Betelgeuse. So here's a, a little uh, movie to illustrate one. Uh, let, me, let me take you down to the bottom part of it here. First, this little red dot that's moving around here is just tracking out uh, what happened uh, last January as it hit its minimum and then headed back up again. And, and Betelgeuse since then has rattled around and been at more or less its normal luminosity. But it got really obviously considerably dimmer there, caught everybody's attention. And then the upper part of this, and the whole plot was put together by a, a Russian crew. I don't know this guy, Sabanov. Uh, so this upper part is a movie of the polarized light. And I confess, I don't really know how to interpret that scientifically. I, I work with polarized light sometimes. I'm not quite sure what it's telling us here. But just qualitatively, you, you can look at what's going on on the surface of Betelgeuse during this dip in the great dimming. And it is a complicated roiling thing. If it has these black dots of some kind, that's low polarization. It's not necessarily dark, it's low polarization. And, and they swirl around and they merge into this spot. And then, then the movie starts over again. But there's something really complicated happening on the surface of Betelgeuse during this great dimming. And, and I, I look forward to these guys. This is basically an observation. What, what actually was going on there? Uh, I, I'd love to hear the interpretation. Uh, Miguel Montarge is, is one of the people who's been studying Betelgeuse for most of his career. He works with the so-called Very Large Telescope, which is operated in the mountains of Chile uh, by the uh, European uh, Southern Observatory. And he uh, took a, a picture. Again, you can actually make out the size of Betelgeuse. That's one of the important things about it. Uh, back in January of 2019, and then at December of 2019, at the start of the Great Dimming, it got its dimmest in, in, in January of 2020, uh, you can see something funky is happening, that, that there is this darkening down in the, in the lower right-hand corner of the star that was quite dramatic, and that was what was happening to Betelgeuse. It, it got dark not everywhere at once, but in that, that, uh, that corner as, as we look at Betelgeuse. You know, cool telescope. I mean, a cool picture. That picture got sent all over the web at, at the time. So uh, there is a hypothesis for explaining this, that Betelgeuse ejected a blob of dust and that the dust is uh, opaque and you, you can't see through it very well and that that blocked part of the surface light uh, from Betelgeuse. So that, that hypothesis was first put out by Emily Levesque and Phil Massey in a paper in, in early 2020. And then a paper by uh, Andre Dupree at Harvard, who is a leader of a large group of people worldwide studying Betelgeuse, uh, put out a follow-up paper. And, and the Dupree et al. paper, where, where this uh, picture comes from, uh, had some observations that indicated that Betelgeuse had a flare of light, an excess of light, uh, back in October of 2019. And, and Dupree et al. measured that with a Hubble Space Telescope. So they're fitting this together with Levesque and Massey and saying, well, that, that blew off a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> and that stuff then cooled and condensed into dust that was opaque. And that blocked part of Betelgeuse, and that's what made it dip. This may be a small thing. I don't know whether it's important or not. But you notice that this, as they've drawn it here, is kind of down in the lower left-hand side of Betelgeuse. And Monarchet's uh, dimming was in the lower right hand side. <laughs> uh, take, take that for what it's worth. Anyway, this this was their their picture. That it's a blob of dust that has obscured Betelgeuse. 
Uh, there are people, I don't know whether this has gotten out into the press yet, but I've talked to people. I, I know there are some Betelgeuse insiders who are skeptical of the dust scenario. And, and they wonder if Betelgeuse looks like this, that it has star spots like the sun, but sometimes bigger and darker and humongous. And, and if you just cool off because of this huge star spot, uh, Betelgeuse, you might make it uh, darker and not have some of the problems they see with it, with the dust picture. No, the fact is nobody knows. There, there's various hypotheses. Uh, and that's actively under fresh observations and fresh thinking. And, and we'll see what the story is coming out of that. So here's the story. Betelgeuse is rotating too rapidly by a factor of 150 compared to uh, basic models. The extra angular minimum, the spin may have come from a merger. Uh, the pulsation period constrains the distance, tells us what evolutionary state it in, that it's not going to explode for 100,000 years. <clears throat> Twitter was covered with, in the great dimming, Twitter was saying, oh, my God, it's about to blow up. And so one of my responsibilities was, was to tweet out and say, no, it's not. And a lot, lot of other people, uh, astronomers, did it as well. It, it's, it's not for 100,000 years. So whatever the great dimming was, it is not uh, preparatory to exploding. Um, so great dimming did not portend an, an, uh, an immediate explosion. Uh, the origin may have been related to a cloud of dust or large star spots. So there are still mysteries that are under active investigation. It's a really important thing to do. Uh, Betelgeuse is prominent in the spring sky. That's why I was checking on the weather beforehand. If it's clear in Baton Rouge tonight, go out and look at it. It's just hanging out over your southern horizon and, and, and looking somewhat like this. Here's the belt and the and, and the sword, and, and here's Betelgeuse, you can go out and check yourself to see whether it's blown up or not. Uh, I, I, I really urge you to do that. This, this is naked eye astronomy you can go out and do on your own. If you wait around 100,000 years, it might look like this. So here's, here's the belt and the, the, the sword, and that's what Betelgeuse will look like. It'll be a, an intensely bright uh, point of light uh, for about three months. So. Hang, hang on. And then, uh, I don't know, do I, I've gone too long, I think. So I, I'll just, I, I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, if you want to unshare, we can start the Q&A. Um, so while we wait, there's a bit of a delay on the YouTube to like us to YouTube side. So um, I'm going to start with just a few like sort of, not personal, but like questions about you because you're the you're the star of the show uh at least for this half of the show okay so we want to know about you and so i introduced you as an emeritus professor and i obviously know what that means but can you just explain what that is for our viewers who might not know what that means uh sure uh, after a long and great career eventually you just kind of uh, you don't really burn out but you want to lay back <laughs> and kind of tone down a little bit and so you retire it's basically retirement, uh, but it's a formal position. You, re you can retire without becoming emeritus. Uh, you have to be approved for emeritus status by the department and your college and the president of the university, for that matter. So it's a, it's a somewhat prestigious retirement status where you, where you still have privileges. I can still uh, use the telescopes at McDonald Observatory. I have a parking spot. I have an office. I have a phone number. Uh, things that I, I wouldn't have if I just retired. It's All a right. good deal. Yeah, yeah. They, just, they, just don't, they don't pay me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I, I live on my retirement salary. Now. Yeah, our resident um, emeritus professor is Arlo Landel. Oh, I, yeah, Arlo is a dear friend. Yes, I, I, I kind of went through that with him and, and talked to him about having to compact his office with <laughs> emeritus and, and clean it up and get rid of he his didn't. books. And, he didn't. Uh, all right, Arlo, hang in there. I did. I went to an office half the size of my old. Career. So you've had a very long career in astronomy. What would you say is your favorite part of like your whole career? Like, what would you say was your favorite part um, so far? Um, in in general, the thing that energized me through my whole career is I've always called myself a new idea junkie. And, and astronomy has just been full of one new shocking idea after another since, since I was in graduate school. Uh, black holes were discovered when I was in graduate school. 
uh, neutron stars were discovered. No, I actually neutron stars were discovered when I was in graduate school. And the first black hole was discovered when I was uh, a postdoc. And, and it's just been one thing after another. Uh, the one single thing was the explosion of supernova 1987A, which was the explosion of a massive star in a nearby galaxy. And, and it just overwhelmed everybody, the supernova game. And we are still studying it 30 years later. It, it's turning into a supernova remnant. It's still got a lot of science to teach us. Um, you know, that, that one event certainly dominated what I was doing. Good, good. Um, and of course, you're more than just an astronomer. Do you have any other hobbies outside of astronomy that you uh, are want to talk about? Um, well, I have some aspirations to write. Oh, I'm and, sure Mike uh, can help you. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> uh, well, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna cheat here for a second. Uh, so I, I I've written a couple of novels. I I wrote this book out of my class. I just recently wrote a a thick book with a co-author on supernovae, a professional level book, but uh, I don't know, can I do this quickly and mess everybody up? Um, <laughs> Are you going to promo yourself? Because that's no, totally allowed. No. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, I wonder, I was going to promote this if I had another 30 seconds. So, so yes, our follow-up speaker, Mike Brotherton, is a, a renowned science fiction author of his own. And a few years ago, he was asked to edit this book of uh, an anthology of short stories written for this. And he encouraged me to write one, and, and I did. And I was being obsessed by Betelgeuse at the time. So my little story in this book is about Betelgeuse. But mostly this is a, to advertise Mike as a uh, absolutely uh, a writer. Stealing my job. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm stealing your introductory th uh, thunder. No, it's okay. It's okay. Um, what would you say a normal day of work looks like for you? Um, it, it, um, you know, when I was teaching, uh, you, you get into work and check your email and prepare class and write proposals and, uh, maybe have a little time to think about science <laughs> and, and the next day you would do it all over again. And, and so my life now is somewhat the same thing, but, but it took on a different structure with COVID. So I say very busy. I work a 12 hour day, uh, but it's kind of structured. So I get up and I try to write for an hour and a half every morning. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to write a book on the future of humanity, which is a course that I taught. Uh, the technological future of humanity. So I'm trying to work on that. And, and then I have breakfast and then I try to do some science and then I read my email. Cause if I read my email first, it takes me an hour and a half <laughs> yeah. to respond to it. And by then I'm burned out and I don't have any energy. And so then in the afternoon I'll, I will do that and do some more busy work. So that, that is very definitely my schedule. Now, I, I'm actually carving out some writing time, get up with a cup of coffee, sit down at the computer and, and try to write for a while. I'll bet Mike is even more rigorous than that. <laughs> I'm sure we'll ask him. Um, and then our last like personal sort of question about you is a question coming from uh, Tabby's son, which is what is your favorite Pokemon? My favorite Pokemon? Well, I, I kind of have a hankering for Pikachu. Oh, OK. Always a good choice. Always a good choice. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so we can get started with a few questions from the chat. Um, our first question, I don't think there were any during the talk, but if there were, just put them again. Um, but um, the first one is from Stephen Dorcher, and he asks, when stars emit flares, they don't turn into ashes the same way that when fires emit sparks do. What process causes a flare to turn to dust? Does it fuse while it is flaring? Um, so the answer is yes. So in a, an ordinary fire, what you're doing is sending off little sparks of wood that haven't burned. And those turn into ash and blow out of your fireplace or whatever. Uh, a star is a somewhat different thing uh, because it's not burning in a chemical way. It's burning in a thermonuclear way. And, and the honest answer is, I think we don't fully understand the flares on the surface of the sun or on Betelgeuse, but on the sun, they're, 
they're very definitely a magnetic phenomenon. So there's a complicated, strong magnetic field on the surface of the sun, and that magnetic field can annihilate with north going magnetic field combining with south going and turn into energy, and that energy then blasts off into space. And so it, it may be that there are magnetic phenomena on Betelgeuse too, but that's hard to measure directly. And maybe partly what that polarization is telling us. Uh, so the, the idea then is somewhat like the sparks, uh, but as, as you take that hot matter and blow it out into space, it cools off. And as it cools off, it will condense into dust. So I think the spirit of this question is, does that happen afterwards? Is Yeah, it just, it just condenses. Uh, forms little grains of, of dirt. All righty. Um, our next question is, question is from Brad Munson, our former MC, and he asks, how close would a supernova have to be in order to have catastrophic effects on Earth? Of uh, order 30 light years, which is, you know, some, some distance, but not very. You know, that's a small distance on an astronomical time scale. Uh, there are no stars right now within 30 light years. We know them all. We know stars out to hundreds and hundreds of light years and, and beyond, but we know every star out several hundred parsecs, and there is no star that's about to blow up. Okay. But, but we do also know how close is dangerous, and, and it's, it's, it's a bad order. What makes it dangerous at that distance that it would? Uh, it, would, it, it, would it would fry the ionosphere. Oh, okay. Yeah, it that sounds good. The dangerous. ionosphere, and we would all die of the ultraviolet light coming from the sun. Good. The ionosphere absorbs that ultraviolet light. Okay, one of those terrifying things that everyone seems to mention in their talk. I, there's a lot of things I would worry about, including wearing my mask, before <laughs> I would worry about uh, that. Alrighty. Um, <laughs> next question is from Manos. Yeah. Um, he asks, Craig, have you ever wore a toga? You bet. Oh, we used to have toga parties when I was an undergraduate. <laughs> uh, I, I went to my first toga party in high school, now that I think back. When you were picking potatoes, right? Well, not at the same time, but the same era, yeah. <laughs> okay. Toga, toga, toga. <laughs> Our next question is from Roger I, and he asks, "What does Beetlejuice have any planets around it? I'm sorry, what's that? Does Beetlejuice have any planets around it? Ah, well, you'll have to leave my little short story to understand that. I, we don't know. Uh, uh, measuring planets is tough, and it's particularly tough if you're trying to do it around a large, bright star. The, the planet would be very dim. And then Betelgeuse is surging around in all that complicated way that, that makes the, the technical aspects of how you would detect the planet uh, very tough. So there's... I, I don't think anybody's even attempted to ask that question. It's just a priori, uh, technically hard. Yeah. My bet? Mm. There might have used to be, but now it's this great big hunking star. It probably ate him up. So maybe there's maybe there's a Jupiter out there far enough that it survived. Uh, maybe. I wouldn't rule it out, but there's no evidence for it. And then um, our last science question is for me because I was just nosy. Um, are there any st other stars that you're obsessed with besides Betelgeuse, or is that your favorite one? You know, I, I, I have some obsessions about ones after they've blown up. <laughs> uh, I think Betelgeuse is my favorite not yet blown up star. Um, Cassiopeia A, the supernova remnant, is a really lovely, complicated uh, the remnant with all sorts of science to teach us that, that although I'm fascinated by supernova 1987A, I'm especially fascinated by Cass A. I'd, I'd love to understand more deeply what went on when that explosion occurred. Yeah, that one has a really pretty supernova remnant and all the multi-wavelengths, uh, right? Yeah, yeah, all, all the multi wavelengths, right? So the, the pictures you see add up to x rays and the radio and the optical, and all sorts of things. Yeah, it's a gorgeous picture. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Craig, for a very great talk. Um, we are going to break for intermission now. Um, so while we are doing that, I would again like to ask you all to consider donating to our Venmo or PayPal. And if you do, 
Just let us know in the comments whether you prefer the fake Percy Twitter or the real Percy Twitter ran by NASA. Um, and we'll be presenting you with some fun space trivia that you can use to impress your friends over the break. And we will be back at 7.57 p.m. I cannot give you round numbers. It is against uh, the rules. So right. we will and see you back here then. Thanks so much, Courtney. It's a lot of fun.
Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for sticking around. Um, we're going to go ahead and get right into our second speaker. He started out as a student of our first speaker, actually. He's now a professor at the University of Wyoming and also a science fiction writer, which we already mentioned. Um, his books are called Star Dragon and Spider Star, if you're interested and would like to pick those up. And uh, last but not least, we would like to wish his wife a happy birthday. And please welcome our second speaker today, Dr. Mike Brotherton. Oh, thank you very much, Courtney. So uh, Craig ran a little over time, so let me tell a couple stories about Craig. <laughs> uh, so when I was in his stellar interiors and structure class in graduate school, he gave us a take-home open book midterm exam. You don't want one of these. I turned in 63 pages. And I was not uh, the maximum uh, on that uh, event. Somebody else turned in like 83. <laughs> Craig may remember. He's like, I didn't expect you guys to uh, do quite so much. And I, 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 after I finished the exam, I, I drew a whole cartoon, um, inked it, turned it in too, about the uh, test of the month club. And uh, well, anyway... I'm a better astronomer for that, and uh, I appreciate that. It was a good exam. We but love I won, the tea. Excuse me, what's that? We love the tea. You have, feel free to spill more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's a small astronomy world. We really do have a small number of astronomers, and there are a lot of connections even across fields. So I don't work on... Supernovas, I find them interesting. I have some publications on supernovas. When you're at the telescope observing and a supernova goes off, people like Craig send you an email and say, please, could you get me a spectrum? <laughs> and you do, and they publish it, and they put your name in the paper, and that's, that's a win-win. Um, and uh, it's, it's good for science. But uh, let's, let's go ahead and uh, get into uh, some black hole business and supermassive, supermassive black holes especially. Um, but because Craig ran late, I'm doing pretty good on the astronomy on tap part. Um, not a beer guy, I'm a wine guy, but uh, okay, here's the black hole. Let me uh, start. My slides here. And uh, we will be talking specifically about not just black holes, but supermassive black holes. You know, if you're going to go big and black, go the supermassive big and black, okay? You guys are going to benefit from, uh, from the delay here, I think. It's going to be very entertaining. So let's start. What is a black hole? This is a um, schematic that you may have seen before. It's a two-dimensional version of a three-dimensional representation of four-dimensional space-time. That's, that's a lot to, to kind of swallow. But um, it represents the depth of the gravitational potential. And where we have a extremely large mass, we have a deep gravitational potential. And in the case of black holes, it gets infinitely deep. So let's talk about just what that means. What is a black hole? Uh, and I think I've had this problem before. Ignore any strange dots. It's astronomy on tap, you've had too much. But a black hole is an object with gravity so powerful that not even light can escape. So what does that mean exactly? We have to consider the issue of escape velocity. 
And this may be something you've encountered before watching rocket launches or something similar. And escape velocity is a representation of how much kinetic energy we need to launch something off the surface of an object. In the case of the Earth, escape velocity is about seven miles per second, 11.6 kilometers per second. If you give something that much kinetic energy, it'll go up and not come down. I know there's a song, what goes up comes down. Song saying raindrops come down. But if you give something enough kinetic energy, enough velocity, it'll never come back. So for an object like the Earth, seven miles per second. But we know that gravity is a force that decreases with distance. It's an inverse square law. And if we were able to climb up some kind of giant ladder off the surface of the Earth and launch from some distance away from the mass, the escape velocity would be somewhat smaller. And similarly, if we were somehow able to crush the Earth, to compress it to a small size so that on the surface, we were closer to all that mass and felt that gravity more strongly, our escape velocity would go up. So what this does is present us with a situation where we could take a mass, the mass of the Earth, any mass, and if we compressed it enough, the escape velocity would increase until it was eventually C, the speed of light. Okay, um, for the Earth, that's something less than, uh, less than an inch. And for the Sun, it's something less than two miles. And it's a uh, linear relationship. And if we were talking about a mass a million times that of the Sun, it would be a little less than uh, 2 million miles. Okay. So in our conventional physics, established by Newton, Einstein, and others, primarily Einstein in this case, no object gets to travel faster than the speed of light. And if you have a mass that is compressed enough such that the escape velocity is greater than the speed of light, you create an event horizon. And nothing inside that Schwarzschild radius, Schwarzschild was one of the physicists who studied this in detail, um, you can't see anything inside this distance. Um, a horizon is something you can't see beyond, and an event horizon is something that you cannot see uh, events beyond this horizon so effectively, any mass compressed enough creates an event horizon that you cannot see inside, and that makes it a black hole. Okay, so that's our definition about black holes. Um, so how can we measure the mass of black holes or, in fact, any object in space? We exploit uh, Kepler's third law of orbital motion and Sir Isaac Newton's uh, mathematical explanation of that based on his law of gravitation. But basically, if you can measure an orbit, the size of the orbit and its period, or equivalently the velocity of an object in orbit around some compact object, you can calculate the mass of that central object. It's, uh, it's basic gravitational physics. So, amazingly, 
there have been a couple of groups. Uh, one at the Max Planck Institute led by uh, Reinhard Genzel and another at UCLA um, that have been observing the Saturn Milky Way for over two decades. Uh, the UCLA group is led by Andrea Gez. And um, the work they've done over the last couple of decades has won them both a joint Nobel Prize for essentially the discovery of a supermassive black hole at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. So what you're looking at here is uh, an animation of um, their data. This one is from Genzel. I'll show you another one from uh, Andrea Gez's UCLA group in a, in a second. But um, they have mapped the trajectories of stars in the galactic core over, over um, a little more than a couple of decades. And they see them orbiting some kind of dark object at the center. We understand orbits. It's Kepler, it's Newton. And we can calculate the mass of that central object that they are orbiting around. And it's about 4 million supermasses. I call that supermassive. I think the sun is supermassive compared to the Earth. But, uh, you know, this is 4 million times the mass of the sun. Um, and I see somebody asking, um, this is based on real data. They have taken the data and interpolated the paths of these stars and uh, made a movie mapping that out. But it is absolutely based on real data. Um, here is another map. Uh, independent data taken with the Keck uh, telescope in Hawaii. The, uh, most of the Genzel data is based on the VLT in uh, Chile, the very large telescope. Um, but this is Keck data that the UCLA group has published showing explicitly the orbits of several stars as they move around Sagittarius A star, which is the um, star in that plot. But um, mostly it's a dark object. It occasionally flares up a little bit uh, in infrared wavelengths. So this takes adaptive optics. Um, it's, um, it's very uh, tough observationally. This really stretches our technology. But dang, look at that. That is so cool. And then it's just orbits. It's stuff we've understood for hundreds of years. And the mass of that central object has got to be millions of solar masses. It's super massive. So this is probably the best evidence for the existence of supermassive black holes. And this is the nearest supermassive black hole to us in the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. But we have been working on other galaxies. And the Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope in the 1990s put a spectrograph slit down on the center of the uh, galaxy M84, Messier 84, on its nucleus. And um, the plot on the right shows some colors. They're looking at a particular emission line. And there's a blue shift and a red shift that indicates gas moving back and forth at very high velocities right in the center, indicating orbiting material and a central mass of about 300 million times that of the sun. Super massive. Super massive. And there's more. It's another galaxy, NGC 4258. People looked at the radio and they tuned in on a particular wavelength of a uh, water maser. It's like a laser, but it's at microwave wavelengths and it's a water transition. And they looked at both sides and saw blue shifted gas moving toward us, red shifted gas moving away from us, orbital motion, and they could fit a rotation curve to that. And the central object's got to be about 36 million solar masses, another supermassive black hole. This is getting to be a really regular story. Okay, here's another observation of a galaxy, NGC 1332. The telescope is ALMA, which is an array of 
uh, millimeter telescopes uh, in the Atacama Desert in Chile. And they are able to map out a rotating disk of molecular gas in the CO molecule. And they can infer the central mass, 660 million solar masses, supermassive, supermassive black hole. Okay, let's move to science fiction a little bit. I am a science fiction writer. I like science fiction a lot. And I loved seeing the depiction of a supermassive black hole in the movie Interstellar. It was called Gargantua. It had about 100 million solar masses. I have some science problems with the movie. I could discuss if people are interested on the one hand. On the other hand, there was a real scientific effort put into trying to understand this. So what you're looking at here is this 100 million solar mass black hole that has an accretion disk accreting onto it. Okay, it's, it's hot gas swirling around, slowly losing angular momentum, falling into the black hole. And the reason you see sort of a round circle halo around that is the gravitational lensing of that mass allows us to see photons coming up from the backside of the disk being warped around the top and bottom of the black hole. So it's kind of complicated looking at hot swirling gas around these massive black holes. Gravitational lensing plays a big effect and we have to worry about that when we try to understand what we're looking at. And the black hole, no light is coming out of that. It's the hot, gas swirling down onto it that is doing the shining um, that we see in active galaxies and actively accreting supermassive black holes. And the movie was based on real science. They did simulations. And you can see here, simulation of a hundred million solar mass black hole with an accretion disk and you do see some differences from the movie. They made some uh, adjustments to simplify things. So, for instance, um, here you can explicitly see the red shifted gas on the right moving away from us, the blue shifted gas on the left moving toward us. And the blue light is brighter. There's an effect called Doppler boosting. When things are moving toward us, they're brighter when the speeds are relativistic. Okay, so that's pretty good science. They were a little uh, tricky. They got the time dilation right. They ignored gravitational redshift. They ignored this effect in the imaging. Um, if anybody wants to talk about that later, we can. But don't try to colonize a planet orbiting an accretion disk around a black hole. Bad idea, bad, bad idea. Okay. So, a couple of years ago, we got pictures of a black hole. Um, Messier 87 is an active galaxy with a supermassive black hole at its core. And we used something called the Event Horizon Telescope. It was an array of radio telescopes spread out all over the Earth using uh, interferometry to create an image with much higher spatial resolution than any one radio telescope can manage. Now, the image looks kind of blurry, doesn't it? But the fact is, that disk of light is about 40 micro arc seconds across. A degree is a circle split into 360 parts. And if you split that degree into 60 parts, each one is an arc minute, and each arc minute is 60 arc seconds. And a micro arc second is one millionth of an arc second. So this is one of the sharpest images that humans have ever made. So don't think it's blurry. This is incredibly sharp. And we're seeing um, the radio wavelength photons uh, around that black hole. And we see one side brighter than the other, just like we did uh, in the simulation uh, from James et al. 
So um, this is really cool. This is something when I was a grad student at Texas, I didn't really think I would ever see in my lifetime. So the technology really drives astronomy and really tests your ideas. And these supermassive black holes really like, uh, really appear to be out there. They are real. And the real universe is really extreme and really cool. So we can scale that M87 image, put it next to our uh, image of a gargantua from interstellar. Maybe we don't have so much of an accretion disk or we're not looking at an edge on angle in M87, um, but uh, science and science fiction come together here. And this is, uh, this is a really cool thing. And I love it when a plan comes together and uh, when black holes come together. Um, so let me finish up leading into a little bit of my science. My science is centered on supermassive black holes, specifically active black holes in active galaxies and the most luminous kind of systems, which we call the quasars. Quasar is a shorthand for quasi-stellar uh, radio source and generally the quasars are in galaxies too far away to take pictures like that. Um, the event horizons are something like the size of the inner solar system, maybe up to um, Jupiter kind of orbits. Um, but we can't image them spatially, but we do variability studies. We swap angular resolution for time resolution. We do something called echo mapping. We watch for the quasars to brighten, and then the ionized gas surrounding that will emit uh, radiation that either gets brighter when the, the quasar gets brighter, or uh, when the quasar gets fainter, that accretion disk uh, feeding it gets fainter, the lines will get fainter. And the fact that speed of light is finite gives us a size scale. And the Doppler effect on the width of those lines, the red shifts and blue shifts tell us about the velocities. So we get orbital information. And these quasars reflecting the detailed studies I've showed you already show everything from 10 to a thousand million solar masses, a thousand million, right? That's like uh, 10 billion solar masses. That's super massive. So, um, you know, my job's cool. I get to uh, spend a lot of time with a telescope, taking uh, observations, repeated spectroscopy, doing this echo mapping. And uh, I get to measure the masses of these supermassive black holes over cosmic time. I get to study how we can do that better. And uh, I'm, I'm basically spending my career, my lifetime, understanding most extreme astrophysics uh, in the entire universe. And there's an interplay between the uh, evolution and growth of these black holes and uh, the evolution and uh, growth of the host galaxies in which they live. So I, I think this is uh, fundamental to our understanding of the universe on the, on the broadest scales. And I just think it's super cool. So um, I'm going to uh, stop there and uh, we can have some uh, questions. Thank you very much, Mike, for a great talk. Um, as I did with Craig, I'm going to wait for some questions to fill up in the chat. And in the meanwhile, I'll ask you some questions about yourself. I'm very curious about um, your writing career. So what is it like publishing a science fiction novel as a scientist? Or just in general? <laughs> well, it's great. You know, I, I think most science fiction writers start off as science fiction fans. You read these stories and they blow your mind. And you kind of want to do that yourself and share your ideas about, you know, how the universe works and the interaction between us humans on our human scale and 
how that relates to existence in the broadest scales. You know, sometimes people say, oh my gosh, the universe is so big, we're so small, we're meaningless. On the other hand, the fact that we have more than a clue about how old the universe is, how big the universe is, what are the things in the universe? Oh my gosh, the amazing things in the universe. I think that elevates us as a species and a civilization. Um, some people say, why should my tax dollars go to studying supermassive black holes halfway across the galaxy? Well, crap, it's supermassive black holes halfway across the galaxy. Isn't that worth something <laughs> that we as a civilization can understand that? That's worth some kind of investment, I think. If, if we didn't know these things, well, why shouldn't we know these things? We're a great species with great technology that we have developed and we're going to continue to grow. There are lots of ways we suck and can fail, but this is a way that we are growing and um, achieving our potential, I think. And this is the best of us, understanding the universe we live in and our relationship to it. I'll drink to that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like, you got me like emotional over here. Um, so what would you, like you say, um, you want to sort of give out your ideas about um, science and sort of weave those into stories that you want to tell and then also communicate just like a love of science? Is that what you say you, you sort of your goals are? Yeah, and science fiction is stealth education. We watch TV, we watch movies, we think, oh yeah, whatever, that's made up stuff, but we see stuff, we believe it. It sinks in, advertising sinks in, otherwise people wouldn't spend billions of dollars on it. Um, <laughs> one of the programs I put together, and I've had funding from NASA, the NSF, uh, the Science Fiction Writers of America, I have a program called Launchpad, where every summer I invite, I don't invite, they apply and I approve about 15 science fiction writers to come do a crash course in astronomy. And the goal is um, twofold. We teach them this astronomy and they do this self ed education, but they also inspire the next generation of scientists. Um, I was a kid, I was six years old, and my parents put me in front of the TV and said, Michael, we think we'll like, you'll like this. And it was Star Trek. I <laughs> like it. And, you know, Mr. Spock was the coolest, you know. He's like, uh, you know, I'm about logic. And he's fascinated by the universe. And I'm like, yeah, that's a cool way to be. He's a great role model. And, and if, if some of the science fiction we put out there that teaches some real science is based on real science, inspires more people to go into science, that's, that's a great achievement. And how much money should that cost? You know, we do the program on like $10,000 a year. Um, and over the last um, 13, 14 years, we've had like 200 authors. Um, they've acknowledged us, they've written award-winning stories, they've had their books turned into movies and TV shows. It's been a great fun experience. Yeah, it sounds like an awesome one. Um, I think probably uh, as an interesting question would be to ask you what your opinions on aliens are. Do you think they're, they're out there? Yes, and I'm hoping they'll come probe me tonight. No, 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 I didn't say that. Um, so statistically, I think aliens are totally likely. Um, whether or not they are close enough in time and space for us to visit them or for them to visit us. I don't know, I'm skeptical. Um, there are many unidentified flying objects seen by people. As an astronomer, I kind of think it's my job when I see strange lights in the sky to identify what they are. Sometimes with extensive modeling and astrophysics. Um, the ones that move around are usually planes or satellites or space station meteors. But I'm open-minded about that. And, uh, you know, I also, in addition to astronomy and physics, teach critical thinking. And it's hard to dismiss 
the alien UFO hypothesis entirely. I think it's appropriate to be skeptical of a lot of reports, but uh, anything's possible. It's, it's not impossible to travel between the stars. All right. Um, so I, you already kind of answered this, but I'm guessing what got you into astronomy was watching Star Trek as a child? Uh, that was part of it. Um, when I was six, I wanted to be an astronomer or a paleontologist. Uh, dinosaurs, right? Yeah, everyone. Yeah, and you know, a meteor probably killed them off. So yeah, those things are are linked a little bit. Um, yeah. I got a little older. I was interested in computer programming. I was interested in science fiction writing. I um, did some art stuff at some point. But you know, I went to uh, I went to college, and I intended to be an electrical engineer. And I got an electrical engineering degree. But I just loved astronomy, and I kept taking the courses. It came time to graduate, and it's like, what are you going to do now with your life? Well, I, I applied to graduate schools, and. Uh, I came down to what do I really love? And it was astronomy. It was, it was um, trying to understand the universe we live in, not just our everyday interactions here on the surface of the earth, but what's everything out there. And it's super cool. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we understand so little. I thought initially when I started graduate school, oh, we got to go study for years to figure out what we don't know. And then you get to that, that edge of knowledge and then you can start pushing beyond it. And I discovered the edge of knowledge was everywhere. It was easy to find things we didn't know and to think of experiments and observations we could do to learn more. So I've been doing that ever since and, and I, I, lo I love it, it's fun. Yeah, um, and then our last uh, question about you is the same one that I gave Craig, which is from Tabby Sun. What uh, is your favorite Pokemon? I don't really do Pokemon. Oh, come I on. I Pikachu because I don't know any better. <laughs> I like Magic the Gathering. I could go oh. into that in depth, but. Uh, all righty, all righty. So but we do comic books. I love Magic the Gathering. I am a science fiction geek and nerd, and those things are fun. The stuff I liked when I was 10 or 12, I still like it. Why stop liking things you'd like? <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, so we can move into some science questions. Um, they're a bit jumbled, so I'm having a bit of a hard time finding them. But um, we have two kind of sort of related questions, which are one, how would the story of Interstellar be different if it had been more scientifically accurate? And then also, how would you have written the story of Interstellar differently? Yes, I wrote a long blog post. I used to blog every day for almost a decade. And I had thousands of, of followers and all that. At some point, it's like, okay, blogging's over. Everything's social media. Um, but um, one of the last posts I made was about Interstellar. And there are some stupid things in Interstellar plot-wise and, and, and logic-wise. So if you have a blight on the earth that um, is killing the wheat and killing some of our... Um, some of the things that we eat like that. Okay, and if it's killing the wheat, you don't have beer in like the opening act because <laughs> you don't, right? Astronomy and tap should know that beer is based on wheat. The bike kills the wheat, you don't have beer. Maybe you have wine still, but you don't have beer. But maybe you can solve the problem of living on the earth if you've got enough time. So why not exploit the time dilation? You go send the whole population through there into the future after you've cured the blight. Because even a blight-afflicted world, the Earth, is a better place to live than a planet in orbit around a supermassive black hole. <laughs> because any orbit around that black hole has to go through the accretion disk which is superheated plasma. This is not healthy. And we worry about climate change and global warming um, with, with temperature increases in a few degrees over a few decades or a few centuries even. Um, the accretion disks around supermassive black holes are not stable. 
um, the things I study, they're intrinsically variable. The continuum goes up and down, and it can go up and down you know, factors of several over several years. Planets don't survive that. Ecosystems don't survive that. It's kind of dumb. Okay, and I say that even acknowledging it was super cool to see a supermassive black hole on the big screen with so much good science from Kip Thorne at Caltech, um, another winner of the Nobel Prize. Um, just, yeah, it was awesome, but disturbing at the same time. Because, because one of my goals, like with Launchpad, the movie Armageddon has, on average, about one mistake per minute throughout the movie. And the goal of Launchpad, in part, is to prevent Armageddon. <laughs> if, if the writers out there producing the science fiction stories we see on science, in, in movies and TV stop having so many errors, I can watch them and enjoy them. But until that happens, I just sit there going, oh, it's so terrible. <laughs> Need another drink. I think I answered that. <laughs> okay. Um, our next one is from Stephen Dorsher. He asks, uh, can you tell from observing a quasar when stars break up in the accretion disk or when they cross the horizon? Yes. So... There is a thing that happens called a tidal disruption event. And the tidal force is, uh, again, the near side is pulled more strongly by gravity than the far side. And in supermassive black holes, the tidal forces are really minimized compared to stellar mass black holes. But stars are big. Um, so for instance, um, we were doing, um, we were studying a particular uh, quasar AIDS Wiki 233, a few years ago. It has a black hole about like Gargantua, 100 million solar masses. And at some point, we saw the continuum, the, the light coming from the accretion disk, it jumped up by, by like a factor of two and then decayed away. And then we saw the surrounding gas respond to that. And the way it jumped up and the way it decayed is completely consistent with a star being torn apart. And the interior, the hot interior of that star being revealed shoots the brightness of that object up. But because we know that the mass of that particular object is very high, we also know that that star had to be a giant star like Betelgeuse because a sun-like star would be too small Tidal forces, would the difference between the two sides would not be strong enough to tear it apart. So we think we caught a supermassive, sorry, a supergiant star like Betelgeuse being torn apart by the supermassive black hole. Hmm. So I had a student working on that, but that didn't work out. Graduate school is not for everybody for all times, um, but we will publish that at some point, and it's a super cool result. Good. Well... We'll be on the lookout. <laughs> um, and then I believe our last question is from Tyler Ellis. Um, and he wants to know, which had better science, interstellar or gravity? Mm. I would have to say gravity overall, but I have to qualify that. So um, I'm buddies with a guy named Kevin Grazier, who's, who's uh, been a guest lecturer at Launchpad. And Kevin Grazier was one of the science advisors on gravity. And um, he is a smart guy and he will defend a lot of decisions that, that he has made and offered. Um, but, you know, some of the things that happen in TV and movies are about how they're shot on the screen and how they look on screen. So there's a couple of scenes that are a little complicated in gravity, but I think they're right. But they made some decisions in gravity about being able to go from the orbit of the Hubble Space Telescope to the orbit of the International Space Station that are, that are technically wrong. 
But if you didn't make those changes to make it um, feasible to go between those, story doesn't work and our astronauts die. And that's kind of a bummer of a story. So those were intentional decisions. They didn't violate science. They just changed what the orbits were to make it story work. Whereas interstellar ignored gravitational redshift, for instance, um, and had beer in a wheatless world. <laughs> so I, I got to say gravity. Gravity is um, overall, I think, a little more solid. The mistakes were intentional to make the story work. Um, whereas I think there were some mistakes in gravity, sorry, in interstellar that I don't think were necessarily thought out. I like both movies and, and I love seeing a supermassive black hole on the screen and I hope to see another within my lifetime. <laughs> me too, me too. All righty. Um, that is all the questions. I think there's actually one more, but you might be able to answer them in the chat. That might work out. Um, but in the interest of time, I will bring back our first speaker, Craig, if he is around. Um, and just thank both of you for two very awesome talks. And thank you very much for um, graciously volunteering to come speak with us today. We had a great time with you both. And we know you're really busy. So thank you for taking some time. Uh, sorry, I ran a little long, but it was a lot of fun. Good no, it's point. okay. It, it was fun discussion. Totally good. Yeah, great, um, great presentation, Mike. You're, uh, thank you. Good discussion. And, um, and now, I, you know, now you know what it was like to have a class with Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have one more thing about Interstellar, though, that came and went so fast, is that the wormhole, it, it is hard to portray. I, wormholes are portrayed hideously wrong in a lot of places. And, and Thorne had his hands on that, and it comes and goes so fast, it hardly plays any role in the movie. But it was a pretty realistic presentation of how a wormhole ought to work and uh, it's just not a big part of the story ultimately but that was a cool part of the movie as far as i was concerned was the wormhole the movie is still so much better than either armageddon or the core there you go, <laughs> there you go. gotta Man, keep an eye keep an cool. eye on it. Yeah. <laughs> okay Are you, i like armageddon <laughs> i it's a fun movie. I'm it's a Bruce Willis, Willis fan. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. like Twilight. <laughs> I like it because it's bad. Anyways, um, thank you all so much for having us today. Oh, you're and like you're very welcome. It was a lot of fun. I want to shout out our two streamers behind the scenes, Allie and Alex, who work very hard to put this show on for us. And it was a very smooth show today. So thank you to them. Before we head out, I have a few more things to mention. If you are watching asynchronously and you're not live with us, feel free to still interact with the video. Leave us a like, subscribe to our channel, uh, follow our social media. Um, our subscribing to our channel will give you notifications for our next show, and all of our social media accounts will have all of that information as soon as it becomes available. As always, do also consider donating to us. It does help us keep the show um, online, and keep an eye on all of our social media for our next show. And next month, we'll have two more lovely speakers for you. And want to thank you guys, Craig and Mike, as well, one more time. Absolutely. A real pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you all for everyone who's watching, and we will now wait for like.